Good morning, everyone. First off, before we begin, we wanted to say a big thank you to Layer One for hosting us. Both of us have traveled very far. Christina, a lot more than me. Come. I came from Europe. I came from the East Coast. I mean, there's no comparison, but hey, it's similar. This is actually our second talk we're giving. Our first talk was in Dublin, so I flew out all the way to Europe. That makes us even. So the <laughs> we both had the travel fatigue, but fortunately, we're on the same time zone as well. Before we start, there are a couple of things you want to start. Who here are Star Wars fans? Show of hands. We have a wonderful treat for you today in the guards. And the second is it's going to be interactive because you get to implement what this Star Wars character does to see its effects in real time. If you're all ready for some interactive hands-on. With that, let's begin. So my name is Tigran Terpanjan. I am a security incident handler for Salesforce. Prior to that, I did red team ops as well as threat hunting for a large consulting firm. And one thing about social engineering and red team and its adversary emulation is that has always stuck to me ever since I was a kid. So I carry that on throughout my career. I am a social engineering specialist with a background in psychology. I am also the main developer of the social engineering training series offered by Cyberis GmbH, the company I am working for in Switzerland. But I am also working in pen tests, needs and vulnerabilities assessments, and of course our beloved trainings. As we like to both say, we do stuff and we go places to simplify it. Before we begin, a little disclaimer. Any opinions offered are our opinions and ours alone and do not reflect those of our employers. And a, a second one is that there is a lot of data sources being involved here and to accommodate for the pattern of thought that we've done to develop this strategy framework, we're gonna guide all of you along so you will not get lost. We'll do our best to keep you on the same path as we did it for the year and a half that we've been developing this. With that, shall we begin with, see? So why Chimera? So red teaming for us is a combination of two concepts developed by Dr. Mark Metesky of Red Team Journal, Gegenspiel and Kontraspiel. Kontraspiel is more contrarian thought or the devil's advocate perspective, while Gegenspiel is more adversarial thought, which we see very much present in current red team operations throughout the industry. However, it is the combina according to Dr. Metesky, it is the combination that makes red teaming what it is. But unfortunately, throughout the industry, most focus on Gegenspiel only. Ryan Ohoro, a leading red team engineer at a large firm, actually developed this chart to outline what he believes are the core competencies for a red team operator as a combination of engineering and ops. For the purposes of this talk and for Chimera, the Chimera framework, we're focusing on the offensive mindset in combination with threat intelligence. Because more often than not, we see threat intelligence teams as a standalone from adversarial ops teams. It is more important to combine them together into the same team when doing this. So, who's familiar with Grand Admiral Thrawn? Show of hands. Only one. Well, well, for those that do not know, Grand Admiral Thrawn was a member of Star Wars Legends and Canon and was leader for the Empire's fleet in combating against the rebels. And his method of style was that he would study his enemy through their tactics, their history, philosophy, and art, and create an entire threat profile on them to help predict their movements. And while his methods were never given a formal name, what Christina and I discovered is that we were able to take the immaterial and transform it into a material framework that could be replicated for actual operations again and again. Why did we pick Thrawn? Because he understands that all different data sources can be leveraged as intelligence and threat profiles to classify different threat actors, potentially predict behaviors, and also give a good understanding of potential wildcards that may come as a result of those behaviors and movements. With that in mind, Christina? Kimmer is a systematic model. It's a model that's supposed to provide a framework for red teams to operate with. 
it is supposed to provide a different perspective because as the grant said, we focus too much on redeeming. When we do redeeming, we focus too much on the TTPs, the malware we have to deal with, we want to deliver this malware, but we want to make it a point that the analytical part is equally as important. And this is why we developed we develop this framework that has put everything into perspective and add the intelligence, the analytical part in everything as well. We start our framework right off with the first module, which is the module of culture. Now, why did we choose culture and why is culture actually important? It is important because culture is the environment everyone operates in. It's the environment that influences threat actors and their movements as well. We should never forget that, yes, we have to deal with their malware, we have to deal with their cap technical capabilities, but in the end of the day, threat actors are humans and they get influenced by external factors that affect their attack timelines. When we look into culture, we look into their heritage, their corporate culture, as well as their team and organizational culture. What type of insights we want to gather are their philosophy, what is the philosophy they operate under, their cultural norms, as well as other th factors, such as their political, military, um, economic, social information environment, their infrastructure, to try to pinpoint what kind of influences they have upon them. For example, it is completely different to have a threat actor that operates in a country that is financially unstable, then you know that their motives are probably going to be more financially oriented, and the assets they target are also more oriented towards something that is going to give them a monetary reward versus a country that wants to conduct espionage. The assets they will target are different. This is something that can be culturally pinpointed. We want to employ cultural frameworks. The PMESII is a very, very, very good one because it tries to make you think, it encourages you to make you think of the political environment and the economic forces of a country. It can be as broad as you want or as specific as you want. That's the beauty of the PMESII. Exactly. The insights that we want to unveil out of it are their thinking patterns, their values, and their ideals, because they will operate with this code. Their motivations, and of course, ultimately, we want to take it down to identifying certain elements of their MO, their modus operandi. We encourage all red teamers to have some cultural exposure to try to explore other cultures and get a better understanding about what is going on so that they can get a better feeling about the threat actors they have to deal with as well. Now, some of you are most probably still wondering, still, why culture? Why did we choose culture? Does anybody else do that? Well, yes. Is anybody familiar with the red team handbook now? known as the Applied Critical Thinking Handbook? It was developed by the U.S. Army and the other uh, joint forces to, to foster a critical analysis mindset amongst the forces, both through enlisted and officers, when dissecting situations and problems. And in, their, for in the first three chapters, one of the primary focuses is cultural empathy and awareness because it is one often a factor that most overlook being brought up in the US. And sometimes the cultural awareness does make the difference between something successful and something that goes abysmal. It's practically their chapter three. Chapter one being the introduction, the general idea of the whole book. Chapter two being self-awareness, practically knowing what is going on in your head. And chapter three being cultural empathy, which tends to encourage people to get out of their own heads and try to, to truly feel the environment and the context in which somebody else is operating. They are not the only ones. From the non-military side, Mandian indicated in its APT-1 report that the core curriculums for APT-1 would include political awareness as well as knowledge of the English language, both on their operator side as well as their infrastructure side, as demonstrated in those two indications, the 101 and 201. The second module is history. Now, when we look at history, we want to study their past behavior. 
We want to study their timeline, we, we want to study their notable strikes, and we want to study their targets of choice. Why? Because that makes them predictable, ultimately. Through this study, we identify TPPs, patterns that are extremely important. You cannot have one incident and consider it a viable move for the next time. You don't know that. And we want to identify their attack execution. Now, as you all remember, probably my background is in psychology, and the reason why we are saying that history is important and through our conversations with began, we have pinpointed and we have seen again and again and again that as threat actors are humans, their past behavior is predicting their future behavior. Also, a very common saying in the psychology field, past behavior is a predictor of future behavior. This is because we all operate under the same principles. If an effort we do is successful, we are reinforced to repeat it. That means that they are probably going to repeat the same patterns again and again and again, especially if they are successful, especially if they have done it more than two times. However, success gets you drunk, and there might be flaws in their plan as well that we as defenders need to pinpoint. So with regards to predictability becoming vulnerability is that once you've developed your set patterns, you become generally would become complacent with how the things are status quo, but that in fact is leads to your own demise. You always have to be adaptive, flexible, understand and anticipate to be an effective operator. Because if you're getting caught every time or seeing the same, the enemy sees the same thing over and over again, they will use that to their advantage. And as a as a threat emulator, you need to adopt that mindset that you must always be adaptive because so is the enemy. Tigran yesterday called it drunk with success and the blindness of success, and we actually want to, to leverage that against them. After we have gathered this information, we have to do something with it. We have to start collecting them, turning it into actionable intelligence practically. Sometimes we will have too much, sometimes we will have too little, but the point is we have, you have to know what you need in order to proceed. And as the grant will say later on, be able to identify attack verticals and remove them eventually. The grant will elaborate on that further on. The point is gather the information that you need, corroborate them, do not, be, do not get too confident with just one incident or two, and be aware of your own biases while doing so. Where you want to go with that, ultimately, is to create a profile of the threat actor. Now, the profile is not going to work the same way that profiling a human or a normal person that you see and you know who you have to deal with works. No, it works the same way that criminal profiling works, which means that all you have to deal with, all you have as information, is the evidence of their criminal activity. This is circumstantial evidence, but this can still be enough. From the evidence that you collect, that you have the hard facts, you move on doing inferences in order to eventually be able to create a profile of the threat actor that you have in mind. What you look at while profiling is the observed activity, the analysis of their TTPs. You want to model their modus operandi. And of course, you need to have a good understanding of their contextual environment. Christina, where, isn't there the danger of stereotyping? There is involved? always the danger of stereotyping, but as the grand said, it is a danger. Stereotypes is something that can either work in your favor or against you. As we mentioned before, we should never be biased, and we have to be careful of our own confirmation biases. However, sometimes stereotypes can work in your favor what you have to do is always remind yourself to analyze your information before you turn them into concrete facts in your head as much as possible. Always remember that threat actor profiles are outlines because you don't know them. You only have certain evidence. They're not fully blown 3D images, but it's still very effective to have that and have an outline of who you have to deal with. We are recommending that for red teams, but threat intelligence teams have been doing it all along. We have the case of Mia Ash. 
uh, secure works did the analysis of the threat actor. And what they did is, of course, what we said before, they looked back into their history timeline, they observed their TTPs. Practically what Mia Ash was doing was create several fake social media profiles and then through them try to connect with key people that she was targeting, create a relationship, and then privilege escalate socially through other accounts and eventually through their work email. They did it successfully multiple times. Eventually she would deliver a poopy rat that they, yeah, through a malicious, through a malicious file practically that they would open and they would get infected. They also identified the targets both in terms of countries and companies that they were targeting. And this is the point again that the grant is going to talk about later on. It has to do with their relativity to industry, who should be worried about a specific threat actor and sh who should not. What they did is again, they took the evidence of their criminal activity, their cyber activity, and from that point on, they started making inferences of them so that they can eventually make an attribution. This is the report, you don't have to read it, but let's see specific parts of it. We see that they try to identify patterns as they line that these actions that Miash was doing were aligning with the threat actor's pattern that they eventually attributed the attack on, Cobalt Gypsy. They identified their TDPs that was in this case, heavily based on social engineering. They looked into trying to make inferences and eventually they were able to pinpoint and say that we assume that this is the, the threat actor behind this activity is Cobalt Gypsy because it aligns with previous Cobalt Gypsy activity targeting and yeah, targeting political, ideological, military and intelligence objectives yeah, that was very much in alignment with what we want, they wanted to do. Again, they are not the only ones. We have FireEye providing another report and saying that they tried again to identify which country was before, behind APT29. <laughs> yeah. Which country was behind 29? And in this case, they looked into the time zones. They looked into their holidays, the days in which they were active in the days in which they were not. And practically they say that they appear to seize operations on the holidays of the country they attributed that threat actor on. Some of you will probably know, some of you might not, but we are not in liberty to name countries. Oh wait, this has been the analytical part. <laughs> the analytical part is very important. It makes you feel like you have a standing, like you know kind of who you are dealing with. But this is one part of the story. The other part of the story is actually doing something with it. The practical aspect of it. All the fun and sweat that the grant is going to talk to us about. <laughs> Who's familiar with the concept of asymmetry, show of hands? What is uh, asymmetry to you, ma'am? Exactly. So red Team's, is anyone familiar with Red Team's blog? Show of hands. So Red Team's blog developed a set of rules and so from his years of conducting Red Team operations in the military and the private sector. And one of the points he made was making, it as, making operations and objectives asymmetrical by stacking advantages. Well, what does this mean? So stacking advantages means taking different random, possibly not related items together and putting them on top of each other in a way that can create bypasses for certain objectives. For example, if there's a high wall, okay, if there are some boxes or a dumpster nearby, just step on it and try to jump over the wall through there. It is as simple as that, but you are taking different data sources together. And when you took data sources together and you've done a considerable amount of analysis, you can see very, very intricate yet random points like, hmm, what if I did this? to achieve that. That asymmetry allows for different perspectives to, to come to you through putting different subjects and topics together. A question that you'd have to ask with regards to threat actors is how do they stack these advantages? What are the verticals they use? And by verticals, I mean which, which subjects or which topics or entry points do they utilize? Can you map it on the MITRE attack matrix for reference? 
Another question is, is can you remove the verticals to disrupt or minimize attack services? And fo as a follow-on to that, is there a way to identify those weaknesses and disrupt those domains to disrupt their op information operations? And lastly, if you want to collect more data on them, is there a way to employ honeypots or honey nets of sorts so you can actually gain live data on their actual operations, much like how Mandiant did with APT1? It's important to remember that an attack plan consists of multiple interconnected components and action steps when you've seen through the Lockheed Martin Keel chain, the MITRE attack framework, FireEyes, compromise cycle. Every attack along the attack timeline comes with a risk of detection. Red Team's blog made an important note that an attacker is most vulnerable to detection right before they attack. Identifying and disrupting parts of it can compromise the whole attack. Because as Mike Tyson would say, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. In, when dealing with threat actors and active operations, it's no different. This is another key point. Emulation is not the same as simulation. What we've noticed in the industry is that many teams go more for simulation. And in this context, we define simulation as we know it's part of a game. We're either doing it for our compliance sake or it's just more of a pretend aspect where emulation is you fully immerse yourself into the threat actor's shoes or boots or role and you consider that the only scope that exists is for the betterment over the organization. There are no timelines, but you're going to imbibe and embrace the role. Much like an actor embraces their roles in films, so too will you embrace that role when you're conducting threat emulation operations. The emulation of the adversary includes their well-defined TTPs and goals. You need to replicate all of your practical findings, the patterns, MOs, specific targets, etc. But it's important to remember that the scope of your simulation satisfies the adversary's goals and motivations. If you cut short, you are doing your organization or your client a disservice. Wait, again, you mean to say that threat actors do not operate on your nine to five? And Absolutely. they don't think the way you do? Well, added to the fact that they don't even have on the same time zones at times, so technically <laughs> they don't. That's why you work on your holidays. This is another point that we want to bring up. Deviant Olam gave a very fantastic talk on red teaming and why sometimes he does not consider his own assessments as red teaming at the SANS ICS Summit in 2018. He mentioned one of the key indicators of a red team assessment is relativity to the industry or client that you are conducting the assessment for. Some questions to ask that he said was, is this threat group a consideration for this industry target? Is this the way I am approaching my target the same way this target would? And are there splinter groups from the same country that would target this? If so, introduce those options. Generally, threat actors will take something very generic. Our teams would take generic items and say, we're just going to emulate an adversary, a generic adversary. It needs to be tailored to your client or to your own organization. Again? Threat intelligence analysis, analysts have been doing that. And we have here the example of malware bytes, where they make it a point to write after every report a section saying, Should you be worried? Meaning, is this threat actor relevant to my industry, or am I going to have to sweat and stay up at night for no reason at all? And this is exactly why we have the point of relativity to industry. The last point to add is adversarial. Question asks, are we truly acting in the spirit of Kontraspiel and Gegenspiel as we defined before? Have all verticals that the threat group that we're emulating been considered? And have we drawn all the services of attack that they would utilize? Physical, social, digital, and outrageous. Because sometimes, some of the most, what some people would find as ridiculous or absurd may very well be the vector that they use to get in and achieve their objectives. So it is important not to consider that nothing is impossible to a determined adversary, as they will use all means and all resources necessary to achieve their objectives, and those need to be considered when conducting these type of assessments. This concludes the main points of the framework. The part on the left is the analytical part, so it, a look in the culture, the history, all the data we need to collect, and 
identify what we need so that we can effectively define which is the identification of dots. And last but not least, the profile of the threat actor with everything that we can use. And then goes a the very practical part that the grant described of making it asymmetrical, of making sure that we emulate the threat actor and not just simulate him just by using the same malware they use and without truly getting in their head and try to, to act the way they would. And of course, making sure that this, the threat actor we are looking at is relevant to us, that we are not doing this effort for nothing, and that we remain adversarial because this is the job of the red teamer in the end of the day. One quote that uh, Thrawn wrote from Star Wars uh, that I really took to heart was, no battle plan can anticipate all contingencies. There are always unexpected factors, including those stemming from the opponent's initiative. One thing that we almost always have a difficult time remembering in these type of operations is that your opponent also has a say to, no matter how good your plan is or how good are your defenses, they will always have a way or an input that was not considered easily. Therefore, a battle must thus become a balance between planning and improvisation, error, and correction. So we're going to do a little exercise here. We're going to give one threat actor to the audience, to all of you, and you will all do, we'll pick on you after a certain elapsed period of time to identify each module from Chimera and to give you a real hands-on experience of what we have spent a year and a half cultivating with different threat actor groups. So for this, since there are eight sections, we're gonna bundle some of them up. Row one and two work on C and H, three and four, I and M, five, six, the remainder because the A, E, R, A can all be clumped together. So we'll give, how much time should we give? Four or five minutes to construct a profile. And, and we ahead. are going to be around, so if you need any input, you can just always lift your hand and we are going to be right there with you. This is for you so that you can just get a feeling of how this all works out. There is no right or wrong answer, this is just an experimentation that you can do and play with. Since, as it was said in the beginning, this is a very hands-on conference, and we are all here to have fun as well. All right, so sorry, I'm beginning. The threat actor of choice is APT1, that Mandiant prescribed as Unit 61 through 935. Yeah, we'll say it out loud, and then we will talk to them.
You can wrap it up and we will start soon. All right, we'll wrap that up right now, and we'll begin with the hands-on interaction with the audience. All right, for APT1, who can tell me about the culture, the Chinese culture, anyone? Yes, sir. target countries as well as other. Excellent answer, sir. Anyone else want to add to that for the culture module? Okay, so what this gentleman explained was that they're very focused, the Chinese are very focused on collecting information, IP from other countries in order to aggregate their base and then sift through data to be able to develop certain products or tools if necessary as more of a catch up process at times as well as they're very goal oriented. It's not, there's not, there's no disinformation or faints or red herring operations they conduct, whenever they do an action, there is purpose and procedure that's associated with it. And the fact that this is a collectivistic country, therefore the goal will usually have to aid the nation, the nation's objectives. Mm -hmm. The H module, who can tell me about the history? Anyone? Show of hands. Yes, sir. The gentleman said that if it's on persistence on certain select targets in some of their states. One thing I do want to add to that is that during their school studies, when they're growing up, they are forced to read Sunsa's Art of War. So that becomes a very, very strong portion of their studies. They're taught to think in, in terms of the art of war. And there was a gentleman from one of the intelligence agencies that explained to me that there's an operational piece as part of the history they cultivate is the concept of shu. If they can perceive that someone is capable of being deceived, the respect for that individual drops drastically and they say, because that we don't have respect for that individual or entity, they forfeited the right to be treated as on the same level. Therefore, we will leverage items accordingly to achieve our objectives. I, anyone want to talk about the I? <laughs> so for identifying the dots is, the concept is with APT1 focused on a variety of industries and based on the data that was collected by Mandiant and generally because of its wide diversification of targets, it was very easy to pick them as a plausible threat actor to emulate because they did not have specific aimings for either intelligence agencies or financial industries. They they picked all of them to go after. Could you repeat that, sir? The gentleman said that English was taught throughout China throughout, and for English-speaking countries were prime targets and as part of the curriculum earlier mentioned in the APT1 report that that was one of their requirements for their operators to be well conversant in as well. M. 
So what TTPs were observed through the APT1 report? Anyone? Yes, sir. And they also can be mapped to MITRE. Now, now that the MITRE's attack framework exists, they can be easily mapped to those, so the digital aspect of their information operations can be mapped. The gentleman said that spear phishing and a variety of social engineering tactics to gain initial access point and, de and deploy Trojan rootkits and backdoors were part of APT1's arsenal. In terms of asymmetry, how did this group make their attacks asymmetrical? Yes, ma'am. organizations, red team, emulate this, and how can, in contrast, the hunt team or the defense team look for this? Any question? Any? Yes, sir. So they used um, some water holding in a sense that they looked where the web traffic was going, and they, instead of going after the target, they went after the target's traffic, and seeing where they went and exploited those websites, because they're probably easier, lower defense. So I'm not sure the legality of tampering something outside of our own scope, but I think it's worth noting that it's hard to read from that. If it could be included within the rules of engagement that to, to make it more emulable and more realistic, allowing certain select sites to, to be able to conduct that specific attack, then, then it is possible. Again, it's all in the contract and the rules of engagements that can potentially bypass that legal or legal gives the sign off on it. Yes, ma'am. Exactly, ma'am. If it works once, why not try and see if it works again and again? Because why recreate the wheel when if it works several times? R. How relative is APT1 to the organization's infrastructure and industry? <laughs> it's relative to everyone because they target everyone's industry because it's more of an information grab. And A. Adversarial. How do we keep the spirit of it being consistently adversarial? Show hands, anyone? If we curtail any aspect of how APT1 operated, we lose the effect of the exercise and the emulation. Because if you curtail aspects of their attack vectors, it diminishes the returns on your own organization or your clients. It must be kept for the sake of realism, or we do a disservice to the community and industry that we are forced to, we are sworn to protect. Yes, sir. Could you repeat the first part, sir? I So those would fall more under the digital sphere. There are certain, it, according to Locard's principle, you always leave a trace of something you leave behind. There will be some clue to indicate that it comes from this country. Now, no matter how obfuscated it is, it's being able to find where to look. You might be able to identify, says, oh, they may be using these tactics seen here, but this doesn't add up. There's a, uh, there's a dissonance between what we've observed and what is shown here. This is more relatable to this threat actor or that threat actor. Does that answer your question, sir? 
Yes, again, nobody is perfect. Certain things are going to leak, and it is part of the investigative work of the and the threat analysis work of your threat actor to find these things out and to corroborate them. Key takeaways out of this process, out of this talk, out of this strategic framework. First of all, the most important one is what we started with. Red Teaming is focusing very, very much on the technical capabilities, and this is great. But it, we want to point out that it's not just the technical capabilities that matter, but also the analytical ones. Knowing who you have across you, how they act, so that you can predict their next step and be a step ahead, be adversarial enough. Point number two, your adversary is not the malware that you have to deal with. This is a, a, a product, yeah, of course you have to deal with it, but behind it there is always a human. And we shouldn't forget the human behind the threat actor. Another key takeaway we want you guys to take away is become comfortable being uncomfortable. There's a lot of data sources here and a lot of fields and disciplines that many are not familiar with and may feel uncomfortable diving into at a certain point, but that's where the growth occurs. Being able to see these different subjects and topics allows you to create different mental models that you can leverage to help facilitate your information security careers, be it you're on offense or on defense or threat intelligence. The last point we do want to make as well is that threat intelligence should be symbiotic with the red team operations that you conduct for internally or for clientele. More often than not, we see threat intel teams being kept separate from red team and that does not necessarily complement or give benefit to the organization or the clientele that you're facing. This is a quote I found from Mark Twight, a, a renowned alpinist and uh, adventure seeker. Struggle is necessary. Confront yourself to believe in yourself. It is not easy and it should not be. Raise a flag against the laziness of spirit. Fly it high. A simple banner can keep the indolent and comfortable from seducing you, not in their fold. This is another question. This is another quote I love from uh, Grand Admiral Thrawn, but it is very long. But if you would like to take a picture of it, you are more than welcome to. It, but in 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 summary, it is a reminder that all of us, there is no immunity to failure and defeat and disappointment will come to each and every one of us. But it's what we learn from those instances that help make us grow as individuals and as professionals. However, there are times where people will not learn from their errors and continue to repeat it. And in terms of adversarial emulation, when you observe that in an adversary, it makes it more, they become more and more predictable. Thank you. So one thing we picked up from Gotham Works, who writes for Red Team's blog, he wrote this very, very profound sort on a call to thinking like a red teamer. And I'll read this. Put yourself in an uncomfortable situations and see what happens. Is there a particular skill set in which you lack expertise? So you might have the digital capability of pen testing or network uh, exploitation. Are you fit enough properly to accomplish a physical assessment or a social engineering assessment? If not, what are you doing about it? If you don't have the discipline to better yourself, what else makes you think that you can provide such a service to someone else? The key point he brought is you must have the strength of mind and character to embrace your own suffering. Once you can achieve this, then the answer to the question of how to think like a red teamer should be clear to you. Some of the references that we showed all along the presentation are laid out here. They are, of course, not the only ones because as a red teamer, you have to have an open mind. You have to study different fields. You have to have a general knowledge on more topics than just one. And therefore, there are, in fact, a lot more sources that have impacted and influenced the whole framework that we provided, with, provided you with. Some of the hard facts that we use are laid out on this slide. You can study it. You can take a picture. You can study it yourselves as well. And that concludes our presentation. Oh, and here's our way of getting in touch. Oh. Why doesn't that work? <laughs> <laughs> here's our contact information. Thank you for listening to our presentation. I know the coffee is just kicking in and it's the first one of the day, but we appreciate you, Layer One, for hosting us as well as you, the audience, for listening to our research and talk. Thank you. Thank you.